pretty painless process. I'll just ask you some questions and we'll just sort of flow into it. Okay. First of all, I'm going to make a marking statement which tells us who everybody is and where we are. And are we ready, Wayne? Yes, we're going. Okay. Uh, today we're interviewing uh, Sonia Malkin at, um, it is January 18th, 2002. We're uh, in Shady, New York. Um, Ms. Malkin, where were you born? I was born in Paris. In Paris, okay. You grew up in Paris? Until I was three. Then my mother took me down to the, to the south. She remarried uh, with a fisherman. And we lived in Saint Tropez. Oh. For about 12 years. Mm hmm. And then uh, they divorced and we came back to Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, just a year before the war started. Okay. What was uh, what was France like uh, just at the beginning of uh, World War Two? When the war started, you mean? Well, just let's say before just before the... that, and well, what was life? What was life like for you? Well, I was a youngster. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my first job. In 1938, I was 14, it was in the summer, and my mother was working as a secretary for the administrator of a big hotel in mm -hmm. Saint Tropez. And so she got me a summer job there, and it turned out to be really an adult job. I was the uh, telephone operator. Oh! And I was having a wonderful time, except that at that time, that hotel belonged to a Mr. Klagen. Mr. Klagen was one of the heirs of Zakharov. Are you familiar with that name? No. Zakharov was a Russian who during the First World War made millions by selling weapons to both sides. <laughs> he was not particular. He sold his cannons, his ammunition mm -hmm. to everybody. He made a lot of money. Uh, 1917, he came to France because there was a revolution and mm -hmm. so forth. So, uh, so his heirs were also very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Kragin had got bought that hotel, which was a huge hotel, for his wife as a birthday present. <laughs> and there was a lot of Russians working there, colonels of this and prince of that and count of something else. And. Um, and it was summer, and I was having a good time. But the, what he did, he had hired all the helps for the hotel in Nice. And he told them that it was a second-rate hotel. When the people came, you know, from the kitchen, for the maids mm -hmm. and so forth, they realized that it was not a second-rate hotel, but that it was a palace. The rates were very high, it was very expensive. Marina Dietrich was there, and you know, a lot oh. of people, diamond sales. I mean, there was a lot mm -hmm. of very wealthy people there. So they asked for uh, their salaries to be, um, what's the word? Raised. Raised, yeah, according mm -hmm. to the, the rate of the hotel. And Mr. Kagan refused. That was in the middle of the season, it was the middle of August. So they decided to go on strike. <laughs> so we, we all went on strike. And we were on strike for about three weeks. And the people didn't want to leave the hotel. Where would they go in the middle of the season, the Riviera? There was no place to be had. Mm -hmm. So they would go and eat in town. They made their own beds. I mean, <laughs> they carried their own luggage, but they didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one point, they even offered to make, the dif make up the difference in our salary, you know, which, of course, you refused. Mm -hmm. And then, um, finally, they decided to close the hotel. So we were all out of work. So my first job was not, <laughs> was not very, very mm -hmm. lucky. Mm -hmm. What did you do after that? After that, we went back to Paris that, mm -hmm. that uh, fall. I went back to school. Uh, I was 15. I went back to high school. And um, I was, took my exam for high school a couple of days before the Germans came into Paris. Mm. Which well, was a very, very bad taste, I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I came back, everybody left, you know, when the German came, everybody mm -hmm. left. The government left for the South, and in fact, you know something very interesting? 
when the, the, the government was gone to, to the south of France, and uh, there was nobody to receive the Germans. I mean, the town was practically empty, except for the ambassador of the United States, Mr. Bullock. Hmm. He loved Paris, and he didn't want to leave. He's the one who, who delivered Paris to the Germans. Oh, really? How do you like that? I don't know <laughs> what, what gave him the right to do this, mm -hmm. but I thought it was very interesting. Hmm. How did you feel as a young lady with the Germans? What was the, the feeling in Paris when the Germans came in? Well, when the Germans came in, there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, the town was practically empty. It just came back, people started coming back little by little. I came back six months later, mm -hmm. and I went back to my school to find out if I had my diploma. And they said, well, I'm sorry, but you know, when we, everybody left, the papers was, were lost, so you have to come back and take your exams again. I said, well, thank you very much, but there's no question of this. I have to, I have to go to work now. Mm -hmm. So I went to work. And, uh, well, when the, when the Germans came into Paris, uh, Hitler came and he loved the city. And he, uh, he told his people to be correct, to pay for everything, to be gentlemen. So that lasted for a little while, but not very long. Really? In the first place they were paying us with army, German army money, which mm -hmm. wasn't worth anything. So it was pillaging, you know, the, mm -hmm. the place. And, uh, and little by little, the French really uh, resented their presence in the city because mm -hmm. it was really felt everywhere. Mm -hmm. Signs everywhere in German, you know. And you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that and you couldn't go where there and you couldn't go there and, you, you know. And you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. You got a button, you got a button, you got a button. And, you know, the hell with this. Even the French are not used to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so the resistance started in Paris in 1940 mm -hmm. in a museum, in the basement of the museum. Musée de l'Homme, you know, at the Trocadero, I don't know if you know the, Heard of that it. huge um, museum. People started making flyers, listening to the BBC, um, and propaganda against the Nazis. So that's where it started. The resistance in France started in 19. How did the Germans react to the early part of the resistance? Well, at the beginning they didn't take it very seriously until they realized it was growing in every direction. Mm -hmm. And then they, little by little they started putting the screw, you know, on and on. They started taking hostages. Um, you, you couldn't have a car. So they confiscated all the cars. Mm -hmm. They confiscated all the weapons. If you were taken, if you were uh, found with a weapon, any kind of weapon, you were shot. <clears throat> I mean, there was no trial or anything. They didn't bother with this kind of thing. Um, and then they started with the Jews. So the Jews first they have to wear the yellow star. They couldn't go to the Champs Elysees. They couldn't go to the opera. They couldn't go into theaters. They couldn't go into movies. They they had to uh, to ride the last car in the subway. Um, I mean, it, it was getting, you know, I mean, the French, I mean, there's been Jews in France since the Middle Ages, you know, we're not used to this Did you have Jewish thing. friends? Oh, yes, sure. My mother had a boyfriend who was Jewish. Uh, when I left for the, for the South, I left my apartment to two Jewish women, the mother and aunt of my best friend, who was also Jewish. She still is, after 60 years. <laughs> um, so life became very difficult, and then... Of course, the first thing that they did was to take everything they could put their hands on. They started, of course, with the gold, with the coal mm -hmm. and iron, because they needed that for the war, and then the food. Well, France is a very rich country. Mm -hmm. The food is plentiful, and, you know. So they took everything that they could do and sent everything to Germany. So we, the, the rationing became so bad. I mean, people were starving. So they, if you had families or friends in the country where you could go and get a pound of butter once in a while or two pounds of beans, you know, mm -hmm. you were lucky. But I wasn't, and I was starving. 
I was starving. I mean, we were never rich in my family. My mother was always working. But I was never hungry. Mm -hmm. This was something else again. You were working at that time? I took a job. I went to, uh, I found an ad in the paper. I took a job as a typist in a small um, office. In fact, I was the only one there, mm -hmm. except for the boss. Now, the boss, <laughs> it's been very interesting, Monsieur Ashe. Monsieur Ashe was a young punk. <laughs> I think he was 22, and I was about 17 at that point. And he, he was the um, only son of a very will, wealthy bourgeois family who put him in this office to get him out of trouble or something. <laughs> so he, had, he was selling, buying, and repairing typewriters. That mm. was the business. Actually, he was doing black market. But that one, and of course, it was for the collaboration. So every day we had terrible fights because I was absolutely against it. Well, we should collaborate. They're German. They're the strongest. They're this and that. And I was against it. So every day we had an argument. Well, one day he came to the office and he wanted me to type leaflets. You know, those little things that to mm -hmm. stick all over the town, you know, against the British, against the Allies. And I said, no, I'm not going to type any. I don't, I'm not here to do political work. I'll do your job for, your, for the office. This kind of stuff, I don't want to do. You better do it or you're going to lose your job. Fine. And he left, slamming the door. And he came back that night just before I was leaving. Not only he was drunk but he was also in a Nazi uniform. Uh, there was a French Nazi party. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but Marcel Bucard was the big boss of that. He was a Nazi mm -hmm. from way back. And um, had a blue shirt and a black tie and black pants and boots and a belt with a holster and a pistol. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> I thought about all the arguments that we had, you know. Then I suddenly realized that I'd been followed in my neighborhood. Some guy had been asking about me to my, to my concierge, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was 17. I'd never thought it was something political, mm -hmm. you know. And then I thought, my God, that is he's having me followed. Mm. So I went to see a friend of mine. She gave me some paper so I could get out of the city, and I left. I never went back. You had to have papers to leave the to city? To leave the city, to leave Paris. And mm. then, to, because the country was um, in two pieces, you know, it was the occupied zone mm -hmm. and the non-occupied zone. That was Vichy, right. with Pétain and Laval and all those bombs. And the, so in order to go to the South Zone, you have to have papers. Mm -hmm. You have to go to uh, German um, police and and, uh, and show Ausweis, Ausweis, you know, pass. Mm -hmm. Right. So my friend gave me a pass, and uh, she was wonderful. She was working in in a German office uh, for the agent. The agency, agency, what was the name? The Todd Agency. They were building the Atlantic Wall, oh, you know, the, right. the bunkers and all those things. So when people came there for work, she would send the bad guys, <laughs> all the fascists and the collaboration, she would send them all to the, the wrong place that were going to be bombed by the Allies. <laughs> and the friends, you know, she would send them in the alto somewhere where it was pretty safe. Anyway, she gave me some paper so I could, I, Across the, across the where, where were you going? Were you by yourself going, or with your mother? I was going south, no. Uh, my mother came back uh, also to Paris, also, so she was in the city. Uh, but I went to uh, Dordogne, which is this um, southwest uh, of France. Do you know the country at all? I should show you a map. Um, it's very hilly. It's pretty much like here, but mm -hmm. very dense forest of chestnut forest. Mm -hmm. And so there was there there was Le Maquis. Now, know? what were you going down there to do? I was going to a farm. Uh, my boyfriend's uncle had a farm down there, 
and he had gone there because he didn't want to go to work to Germany. He was 20 years old, and he was going to, to be sent to Germany to work. So mm -hmm. he escaped and uh, was working in his, uh, his uncle's uh, farm. And they had a uh, forest, and they were cutting wood, and they had a sawmill right there at the farm. Mm -hmm. So I was there, and I really didn't know what to do. I was brought up in boats, you know, but I, what did I know about farming, you know? And I couldn't tell the carrots from the weeds, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was... Anyway, at the sawmill, there was a Jewish man, Elias, who was a refugee from Paris. His whole family had moved down south. And he was the foreman of the, of the mm -hmm. sawmill. And uh, he, he, he knew that I was lost in this place. And he said, you know, if I paid your trip back to Paris, would you go back and, and uh, bring a letter to some my family? Uh, they don't know where I am, and I'm sure they're worried, and so mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, my pass is still good. Sure, I'll go back. So he gave me these papers, and I went to see his family. I don't think it was, this was his family. Well, it was, what it was, I think it was the Jewish underground. Mm. So they said to me, if we pay your trip back, would you go back to Elias and bring some papers for us to Elias? Uh-huh. Yeah, I can do that. So there I was. So I went back, and uh, Elias said, you know, it's very curious, aren't you? I said, oh, yes, but I don't want to know. <laughs> the least I know, the better. You know, it was your family, you, you know, you find fine. fine. Uh, I don't really want to know. So I said, you know, uh, I know some people who could use somebody like you. Um, you're French, you're not Jewish, your papers are in order, you can, you, you, you can travel, um, you don't mind moving around, um, you could be very useful. And I said, well, to whom? You know, who is there around here? He said, well, in La Bessede, which is a huge forest nearby, there are lots of Spanish people who have been, uh, who came over the mountain in 39 and uh, who, who doing making charcoal. Mm -hmm. That's their livelihood. And they're cutting wood for the sawmill. That was the connection. Okay. And, um, but the officers are reorganizing this man into a group of a guerrilla hmm. to work with the French resistance. And the French resistance was pretty active in that part of the country. So this is your first introduction so into the... That was the my first introduction. Okay. That's how I got, I fell into the underground, <laughs> so to speak. I didn't choose to, you know, got up one morning and say, oh, I think I'll go into the resistance today, mm -hmm. you know. And it was not that. Um, so I said, well, I'd like to meet these people. My mother had a lot of Spanish friends. She used to work for the Quakers in Paris, and she was working for the Spanish refugees, mm -hmm. uh, bringing food and clothes and medicine to the camps, or the refugee camps in the South which were absolutely miserable because there were so many people, the French didn't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. So um, she had made a lot of Spanish friends, so I was very familiar. I could understand a little Spanish and so forth. I love flamenco, you know. So I said, okay, Spanish it is. Well, let's meet, meet them first. So um, there was a meeting with uh, Carlos, who was one of the leaders of the group in that area. Mm -hmm. And with Carlos, there was Mr. Tovar, and we called him Alberto at the time. And uh, Alberto took over the, this meeting, and I said, I thought I was going to work for Carlos. He said, well, Carlos works for me, so you're going to talk to me now. I didn't really like his attitude, mm -hmm. you know. And he said to me, well, uh, are you afraid of the Germans? I said, what a stupid question. Of course I'm afraid of the German. Everybody is. I saw them beating a man in front of me in Paris in the street because he crossed the street in front of a, in front of a convoy. They practically killed the man. You <laughs> mean if I'm afraid of them? Everybody is terrified of them. 
You know, you have to be totally stupid not to be. <laughs> so he said, well, if you told me that you were not afraid, I wouldn't have trusted you. Fine. So now you trust me, right? He said, well, not quite. He said, because I don't know if you can work with fear. And I said, well, that I can't tell you. I don't know. You know, I'll have to try and see what happens. So he said, okay. Tomorrow morning at 7, you'll be at the station. And there'll be a blonde, tall blonde girl there. And she'll tell you what to do and where to go. So the next day, there was Blondine. And she was waiting for me. She was from Lorraine. She had been working with them for a while, but she was from another part of the country and it was very difficult for mm -hmm. her to do everything. So they needed somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's why the way, so I started with her. She showed me the ropes. So at this point you're what, 17, 18? 18. 18? That's a lot of responsibility for an 18-year-old. Well, it was. Uh, but it was also the big adventure. Right. You know, uh, I was free. Um, I was healthy. I had no responsibilities. Um, I loved to travel. Uh, it was it was a big adventure. And if I could do something to the Germans, I would, you know. So what exactly? What, what was your job? I was a courier. Uh, I transported papers, mm -hmm. reports, uh, money. Once in a while, weapons, but very rarely, because that was not really, uh, that scared me to death. Because every time I did something, would happen to scare me. I mean, really, and uh, so the, uh, the least possible. The papers were bad enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had been caught with them, I would have been shot, or, or worse. There was a girl who had been working uh, for the Spanish for, for a while, and she, she was arrested, and she was tortured, she was gang raped, she was, uh, they cut her breast off. Uh, and you know what they did to this kid, I mean, you wouldn't believe it. And she never talked. She was 18. Mm. I, they told me later that I took her place, which at the time I'm glad that I had known. You know, I would have thought, thought twice about it maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very dangerous, uh, very dangerous thing. But I was not. I, I was very shy for one thing. I was very reserved, very shy. And so I would never attracted attention. I, I was not beautiful. I was not, you know, anything. I could go through the crowd. Nobody would pay attention to me at all. And I was on bicycle most of the time. When it was too far, I would take a bus or the train. And sometimes I had to take the three of them. And even then, um, sometimes. Uh, Everything really happened. I was so lucky. I can't tell you how lucky I was through these years. I think I had a very busy guardian angel, you know, <laughs> who fall asleep once in a while, <laughs> just in time, and then wake up just in time to get me out of trouble, you know. So you had some close calls? Very close calls. Um, once I, I was carrying this little suitcase full of pistols. I had wrapped them up and wrapped them up into, into newspapers and and uh, I had to carry the I had to go by bus quite a big distance. So I take this bus and I'm waiting on line for the to get into the bus and behind me suddenly I see this big shadow on the ground. It was a German SS. Very tall SS. What he was doing in that bus I never know. And he seen me carrying this little suitcase, which was very heavy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever carry a suitcase for a pistol, but it is heavy. Well, he was going to be a gentleman. He said, oh, let me carry the suitcase for you. It's too heavy for such a little girl. Oh, no, no, really, I can't. I'm very strong, you know. I can do it myself, thank you. Said, no, no, no. And he take the suitcase away from me. Get into the bus and put it on, on the... Uh, the rack? The rack on top. And uh, he sits right in front of me. And, uh, and he said, what, what's in the suitcase? It's so heavy. And I said, well, the, the books. I'm a student. You know, it was in the middle of July. I'm in vacation. And uh, that, that's my book. 
but yeah, I heard something metallic in it. So he was looking at me, and I said, uh-uh. And I said, well, I have my, my ice skates also. And then I thought, what a stupid thing to say. What am I doing in July with ice skates? In part of the country that never see ice or snow. I mean, you know, this guy is going to, to think that I'm nuts or worse. So I started talking to him, you know, very fast, you know, that I was a skater here and a skater there. Oh, and he said, oh, I'm a skater too. I'm from Hamburg, you know. And he started telling me about all the champions from Germany, you know. And I kept him talking and <laughs> talking until the next stop. And he carried my suitcase down. <laughs> I said, goodbye! <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh, God, I've never been so scared. And things like that happened to me three or four times more, you know. And at the time I was with Blondine, she saved the day. That was at the very beginning that I was working with her. She, uh, we had plastic, you know, this famous explosive mm -hmm. plastic in our saddlebags. Both our, our bicycle saddlebags were full of plastic. And it was a beautiful day, we were going down the hill, and then we realized right at the bottom of the hill there was some gendarme, the French troopers, you know. And you never knew with them. Some of them were with the resistance and some were not, so you really took a chance with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they stopped us. Well, girls, what are you carrying in those saddlebags? And my friend, she had a little handbag uh, on, on her handlebars and and she had a piece of bread in it and a knitting or something and she put it right under the gen gendarme's nose and she said, what do you think, we're carrying bombs or something? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed she said, all right girls, okay, go ahead, you know. They probably thought we were doing some black market, you know, with food because that was the most mm -hmm. you know, essential thing for everybody. So they let us go. You had to be pretty quick-witted to survive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Ah, uh, another, another time, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I was, um, that was almost at the time of the liberation of Toulouse, that was in 44. And I was uh, given some papers to bring to a general. And uh, here I am with my little suitcase that has a false bottom. Mm -hmm. Put the, the papers in the false bottom, put my clothes on top. And then Tobar said, Here's a pistol. Those papers have to get there. Even if you have to shoot your way through any kind of situation, those papers have to get there. I said, listen, I don't want a pistol. You know, I really don't. I said, no, take it. You may need it. Take it. So, you know, if you're going to use a pistol, where would you put it? You put it in your pocket, in your belt, you know, in your back. I put it in my handbag. I was not going to use the damn thing, you know. I put it in my handbag. I remember I had a brand new navy suit. I was so happy about that. This was the first time I bought some new clothes for about three years. And I had a handbag which was the same color. You know, the Parisian mm -hmm. girls, you know, the, everything had to coordinate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my bag was navy blue also. And I had my pistol in there. I get to the station in Toulouse, which is a pretty big city. It was the, the last big city before the board. And we get out of the train, and I opened the, the door, and right outside the gate, there were Germans all over the square. I mean, all the streets were barred with, with tanks and with, and with cars, and, and uh, some French police, but mainly the German police and some SS. And they were searching everybody. And I thought, well, girl, this time you had it. The damn pistol is going to do you in. And, you know, I never panic. This is something that, that I can say for myself. I panic later, you know, like <laughs> three months later, I start crying for an hour without any reason, you know. So I thought, well, I can't shoot my way through this one. No way. So I go through the gate to the gate. They opened my suitcase, they looked in there, they didn't see the papers, closed it back, searched me, you know, couldn't find anything, and they let me go. They didn't look in my pocketbook. They didn't look in, and I'm just there, and I'm petrified just waiting for them to do it, 
you know. And they pushed me and said, come on, get out of here, you know. <laughs> so my, by that time, my knees are, are shaking, you know. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe my luck. I said, this is not possible, you know. And I go to all the square, you know, with all those Germans all over the place. And this is the kind of luck that I have, that I have all through the war. Did you develop friends in this? Uh... Well, the Spanish, the Spanish friends became my friends, yes, yeah, so mm. they were wonderful people. Um, was it hard to trust people? Well, I, to trust them, I trusted them with my life, you know, and they trusted me, which was um, probably more difficult because they, they're completely vulnerable. Mm. You know, if I was arrested in torture and I talked, um, I mean, the, I lived in the woods for two years, 75 Spanish men. I was the only girl, <laughs> and I was the only French, and I was the youngest. So I was the kid. Mm -hmm. I was the mascot, you know. And I was a soldier like them, I ate like them, you know, I, you know, I, own, I had my own tent. But I was treated the same uh, as they were, and uh, if I had dressed like them, I had nothing else. Um, and they were wonderful. They, they, they became my family, mm. you know. They were all kind of men. They were, there were students, law students from Madrid. There was a lawyer from Barcelona. There was, a, there was a, a, a water carrier from Galicia, couldn't couldn't speak, I don't think he could read or write. Um, there were some communists, there were some socialists, there were some anarchists, there were some union men, there were some people who were just republicans, who just hated the fascists. Um, there was just, it was a mixture of everything. Mm -hmm. There was, and then Churi, Churi became my bodyguard. He decided he was going to be my bodyguard. Churi was, um, a little guy who, uh, before the war in Madrid, he was making churros, churros like like donuts mm -hmm. in the streets. You know, he had this big basin and he was making the churros in the street. So they called him Churi. That was his, that was his job. Very simple guy. He, said he had all kind of scars on his face that he had from the war. Um, and then he was shot at one point on the road one day. And they brought him back to the camp, and uh, we didn't know if he was going to make it. He had five bullets in his body, and they couldn't be removed. We had a doctor with us, and uh, so I would read the paper for him, and I would roll his cigarettes, and I would tell him jokes, and you know, and and after that, you know, nobody could touch me or do anything to me, or you know, he was my bodyguard. He was just, you know, that was it. Was chewy. I still have a picture of it. I think I have a picture of it. Um, there was a there was a general. There were soldiers that that, that were you know like Tovar and Acevedo. They were our career um, mm. officers. Those were the one who reorganized the uh, the groups. And. Um, they were, they were so brave. They never complained about anything. They, was, they hadn't seen their families for four, five, six, seven years. They didn't even know if they were still alive. Did you have any contact with your mother at this point? No. No. She, did she have any idea of where you were? She, she didn't. She, she knew I was in the south somewhere in Dordogne. And that was all she knew. We, I couldn't communicate with her. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, in fact, the, the mail was very slow anyway because it was censored. Mm -hmm. at the border, <clears throat> so we couldn't, uh, couldn't say anything. And I didn't want her to, n to know where I was, right. just in case she was arrested. And, you know, then she... Oh, my mother. The thing that my mother did during the war is the thing about her. Here she has, uh, she has two jobs. She has a Jewish companion, which was against the law. My grandmother, whose house had been bombed to the ground and burned to the ground. My little brother, who was 10, 11, 12, and my little sister, who was 2. 
And with this whole household and looking for food for everybody, she had to feed everybody. And she, uh, she was making false papers. She had a friend who was a, a woman who was a um, teacher. She was teaching art, drawings and paintings in, in a big college in Paris. So that woman helped her copy um, German stamps mm -hmm. and cut them in linoleum, you know, to mm -hmm. you know, copies of them. And then she knew Spanish, a printer who could get, off by what combination, I don't know, could get paper. So they were making false card of identities. She made, she made thousands of them. She made baptism certificate. Um, she made demobilization papers. She would make passes. She'd make uh, thousands of papers, thousands. For people she didn't know, I said, Mother, one of these days somebody is going to give you up. You know, you could get arrested. The whole family could, could go to Germany, you know. She said, well, you know, we have to take chances. I mean, when those people come to me and, and, they, and they're so desperate, what can I say? I can't, I can't say to them, no, I can't help you because I don't know you. I can't do that. And she went through the war also like, you know, like, like a miracle. So when I asked her, she said, after the war was over, she said, why do you think it happened that you were never bothered by anybody, by the police or the Germans? She said, well, I think the reason why is because I never asked for money from anybody. Hmm. She never did. She never asked for a dime for anyone. Which was probably a very romantic idea of my mother, you know, because money or no money, she could have been arrested. Mm -hmm. But she was a very brave woman. She also was working with the British, uh, looking for apartments in Paris for radio. Oh. For, for people, in, uh, you know, because they had to change all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what she was doing. She was looking for apartments in Paris. She went through all kinds of very strange things too. Um, so I guess it, you know, adventure can run the family. <laughs> so you were with uh, this group of seventy-some men for two years. Mm. Yeah. And, and I tell you one thing, I never felt so safe in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Much safer than in New York City. <laughs> I tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I knew one thing about the Spanish men. Women were good or they were bad, and that was it. There was nothing in between. And you mm. didn't flirt with them, you didn't fool around, you just, you know, kept your place. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I did. Excuse me a second, we're going to change tapes. Okay. Very good. This is story. I'll show you her book. Oh, neat. Um, We're back? Yep. Okay. Um, now, you, you were in w with this group from 1940... 43 until 45. To 45. 45, because after, even when, the, after the war was almost over, um, well, in the first place, there was an expedition in Spain. In now, what was that all about? In 44. Now, what, that was kind of Don Quixote kind of thing, I thought, at the time. But if they were going to go to Spain, I was going to go to Spain with them. They fought for my country, I was going to Madrid with them, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they thought that if they had an exp a military expedition in Spain, that was covered by the newspapers, that would make enough noise so that the Allies would recognize a government, a Spanish government in exile mm -hmm. against Franco. Which, of course, didn't happen. Uh, de Gaulle would have loved to beat the heck out of Franco because he hated the guy. He didn't have anything to fight him with. Mm -hmm. France was Empty. I mean, right. it was bled white. Right. So the gold couldn't help. The British wouldn't help. And the American even less. The Americans said, ah, oh, no, Franco was neutral during the war. 
you can imagine how neutral this guy was. There was a lot of food that went from Spain to Germany, mm -hmm. a lot of it, to the point that the Spanish were very hungry too. And of course the, uh, the submarine, the ships, you know, that mm -hmm. would come on the, on the, uh, in the Spanish harbors who help all through the war. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing neutral about him. But um, we couldn't touch Franco. So we went over the mountain on foot. Who led this expedition? Tobar. Now how many people were? About 2,000 in different groups. Mm -hmm. um, I was with the etat major, um, the head corps people. And uh, in fact, I was the only girl. No, there was another girl. She was a nurse with another group. We were the only two girls. Um, we went across the bloody mountains. Oh, God, was that a high mountain. Oh. I know, you know, I was raised on the, on the Riviera, I went to Paris. Why did I know about mountains, you know? It was very high. Anyway, we walked all night. On th and I said, why don't we take a pass, you know? And, and he said, but that's the pass, you know? <laughs> So we went up, and then the next day we went down. I realized that going down was even worse than going up. Mm -hmm. And we went down on the other side, in a little village named Bosost, and uh, we took over the, the, the village, and uh, the fascists that were there, the police, they all fled. They didn't know what was happening. And, uh, and we were there for about two and a half weeks hmm. and they were fighting and they sent soldiers against us that were youngsters and they were all very young 19 20 years old and they said they told us we were going in maneuvers <laughs> they, and they were very shocked to realize that the bullets were real you know, they were, they were really taken, taken in by their own people, you know, they couldn't get shot, you know. And um, so we gathered them together. We had about 200 of them prisoners. We put them in the barn and we talked to them, to tell them what we were trying to do, trying to raise the consciousness of the, of the Spanish people. Maybe they could rise again, you know. But they were not ready to do that. You know, the, the war was only finished about six years before. Mm -hmm. It was so fresh yet, you know, and they still remember the bombing and then the, the massacres, and, you know, they were not ready to start that again. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't get the, the, the Spanish people with us. We couldn't get the Allies' interest with us. And then it started to snow. That was the end of October. It was very cold. It started to snow, so we had to get back. And I'm telling you, that was one of the hardest things that I've seen those people do, is to go back. Because they were in Spain, they were home. Right. They were going to go back home, you know. They're going to fight for their own country. And then they had to go back into France again. They, I mean, some of those men were in their 40s, 50s, and they had tears on their faces, you know, for the first time. I, I, I could see something like this with them, you know. And, it was just heartbreaking, it was just heartbreaking. I was mad as hell. I wanted to go to Madrid, but we didn't. So we went back, and that was the end of that. It was in the papers. I'll show you the papers. Okay. Did the Germans come after you at all? No, the Germans weren't there anymore. It was in 44. Okay. Uh, in October 44, Paris was liberated. Uh, the war was still going on, right. but the Germans were going back to Germany by then. Right. The Seventh know, Army was coming seventh up. Seventh Army and going up from Provence, you right. know, from Marseille up. And um, well, Normandy was pretty much over by then. Although it took them quite a while to get away from there. Mm -hmm. It was really bad. How, uh, as the Germans were being pushed back, how were the collaborators being treated? Well, some were shot, the bad ones, those who, were, who had given up resistance uh, fighters to the Germans, 
those we had no pity for those. Some were arrested. Not all depend what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, if there was just collaboration because they were just like the Germans, but there wasn't much we can do about them, you know. Or they may go to prison for six months or a year or two, or depending if they were doing black market mm -hmm. with them. It all depended on uh, what they did. What happened to your former boss? Monsieur Asher, no, I, you know, I still wonder to this day whatever happened to him. I, n I don't know. Mm. I never knew. I didn't go back to find out. Um, I never knew what happened to him. What um, did you think of de Gaulle? Well, de Gaulle was a very brave man, very straight, very honest. His integrity was beyond suspicion of any kind. He was a conservative, a right-wing, uh, but a patriot. Intelligent, uh, a good soldier, who knew a lot about strategy, who knew that the next war, the modern war, was going to be with tanks and aviation. Mm -hmm. He wrote a whole treaty on that, which Hitler read and used. The French didn't. The general uh, who were with the French army, like Gamelin, Completely incompetent. They were still fighting the First World War, you know, with trenches and stuff. Uh, completely ignored the Gaulle's warning. He was telling them, get planes, you know, get tanks. Mm -hmm. They didn't. And so, this, you know, when I talked to Americans, they said to me, oh, the French didn't fight. There's nothing that made me more angry because it isn't true. It really isn't. Uh, when the Germans came over to the West, and first they started with Norway. That was, that, that was a shamble on both sides. Mm -hmm. The British, the French, the German, nobody knew what they were doing up there. Anyway, the Germans finally took over because the British suddenly were busy some other place. Um, then they invaded Denmark. Do you know that the Danes didn't shot a single shot? When the Germans came in, not a single shot. Mm -hmm. So that was done very quickly. They had time, though, to take all their Jews, put them in boat, and send them to Sweden, which is a 20-minute boat ride, you know, right on the other side, which was very nice. But that was easy for them to do. Then they went into Holland. Then Holland was a little harder. The people there really fought, especially around Rotterdam. There was really battles there. Uh, and then they went into Belgium. Now, the Belgium was saying, we are neutral, we are neutral to Hitler. You know, we couldn't have cared less if you were neutral. But those idiots, they wouldn't let the French soldiers and the British in their country. Mm -hmm. So when Hitler came in, anyway, with his tanks and, you know, I mean, it was like a, like a wall of, of steel and mm -hmm. fire and, and planes and, you know, there was nobody who could resist this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It was like a juggernaut, you know. So, so they finally let the French and, and the British in. By the time it was too late. So that was on May 10 that the German came into Belgium. By the time the last British left Dunkirk for England, that was on June 7, so it was almost a month. Mm. Now for a whole month, the French and British fought those bloody Germans. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me that they didn't fight. As um, the Germans were being pushed back, what, what did your group, your merry little band, do? When? Uh, in the 40... Uh, I'd be in 45. Well, Once the Germans were being pushed back, what were you doing at uh, that point? Well, I was still with my friend Spanish. They started, um, they kept being organized. Well, in the first place, they were trying to get papers, you know, from the French government and to get some kind of normal life, to get jobs. Some had started families. Um, so they were trying to get some kind of normal life, but at the same time, 
their officers were trying to keep them together just mm -hmm. in case they wanted to go back to Spain. Now, they were training um, some of the Spanish people f to go back to Spain on their own, by themselves with a specific... Mm -hmm. You call them terrorists, I suppose, you know, for, for doing one thing or another. Uh, two of my friends were caught. Uh, Luis, he was from Catalonia. He was a student, and he used to tell me, when I'm the mayor of Barcelona, you'll be my first citizen of honor. <laughs> I said, Luis, I'm counting on you. Yeah. He was shot in Barcelona. Then there was Navas, beautiful, handsome, sweet Navas, 25 years old. He went back to Madrid to see his mother doing some kind of work too. He was arrested and he was garroted. You know, that was the Spanish um, capital punishment, you know, the garret. On a public square in Madrid, you know, with his mother there and... Oh, nervous. I couldn't believe it. As the war wound down, um, how did the French treat this group of Spaniards? Well, they treated them well. I mean, there was no reason not to. On the contrary, they were very, um, they were very nice to them. Uh, the, you know, they were soldiers who mm -hmm. came on their side and and helped them and died. You know, there was two thousand of them died in in Ravensbrück camp alone. The Germans hated the Spanish because they they remember how, how much they resisted in Spain. They were, they threw dogs at them when they caught them. Um, the, what what they did in forty four uh when the normandy uh invasion started i remember that day because i walked forty miles that day really? that's one day that i will not forget they they were um blowing up bridges mm -hmm. they were blowing up tr uh, railroad tracks they were blowing up uh, trains full of munitions uh, factories, um, anything that could help the Germans, they would blow it up. And they were good at it. They had experience from, from Spain. Mm -hmm. We had one division of German, the Das Heich Division. I don't know if you ever heard of them, the Wessis Panzer mm -hmm. Division. Just for us, just for the Dordogne, because they knew it was a nest of guerrilla. And what they did, those bastards, they, what they did to us. They were burning farms, they were hanging people, they were raping, stealing, killing. They killed two men uh, in that little place where I was. There were three tanks. They, they would come on the road. They wouldn't come in the woods, they would stay on the road. But they caught those two guys on the road. And they make they shot one of them. The other one, they make him lie down on the road. And then the officer told the tank driver to run over his legs. And then he came back and ran over the whole body of the guy. And by the time they left, we couldn't tell there was somebody there. You know, there was just a mass of red stuff and bones and you just couldn't tell it had been a person there, you know. And um, he was with, the f those two guys with, was with the French group. The French leader was René, his name was Soleil at the time, and he, Soleil is still a friend of mine to this day. Mm. And uh, it was two of his men and he saw what happened from the top of the hill. And he said, I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to get this officer. So they ambushed those three tanks. They threw a grenade in one of them. It fell right into the turret, you know. <laughs> so that stopped the other two. So the officer came out. And um, by that time, they came, you know, they came out of the woods and, and uh, arrested him. And, and then Soleil said, okay, to the officer, now you lie down on the road, you know. And he talked to a guy who had a truck, and he said, I want you to run over this guy's legs, you know. And 
And then before the truck got to the guy, <laughs> he thought, what in the hell am I doing? I'm doing exactly the same thing that this bastard was doing. Am I any better than this SS? You know, so, so he just shot him instead. Uh, now, are these SS soldiers French? No, no they were German. German, no, German, they were German. SS. Oh, yeah. There were very few SS uh, uh, that were French, and most of them were Alsatian, uh, which, which started a big thing after the war was over because they said we were mobilized, we were in Alsace. Alsace became German, we became German, they mobilized us, they put us in the SS and that, so we did what we had to do, we obeyed orders kind of thing, except that that wasn't true because the SS were always volunteered. Well, that's, that was a long, that was another story. There were a lot of stories mm -hmm. after this one. But there was um, several divisions of Germans in the south of France and uh, the order was to stop them as much as as long as possible so they wouldn't get to Normandy. Mm -hmm. If they had been able to get to Normandy, it would have been very bad for the Allies. Mm -hmm. They may not have been able to stay. So we did everything we could to slow them down. And we paid the price. Um, we would constantly harass them on the road. We would mine the road, we would blow up one of the tanks, and then the whole bunch of them had to stop. Um, we did everything we could. We blew up a bridge, you know. and every time they would stop into the nearest farm and burn it down, the crop and everything. Uh, they, they hang 15 people on the bridge, you know, on the side of the bridge. In a little town named Tulle, they arrest a hundred hostages and hang them on the balconies all around the square, the town square. A hundred people hanging there. They stop in one little town named Oradour, Oradour sur Glane. Quiet little town in the middle of the countryside, nobody why they stop there. They took all the men, put them in the barn, sh shot them with a machine gun and put the thing on fire. They took the kids out of school and all the women and the sick people and put them in the church and blew up the church. They killed 650 people that day. There was one little kid who managed somehow to go out of a window in the back of the church and he managed to escape. And a few other people who were out of town that day. But the whole town was massacred. They never rebuilt the town today. Still a, a museum to the, yeah. to the horrors of the Nazi. And you know, I almost got there. Talk about lucky. I was on the road that day on my bicycle and it rained. Suddenly there was a storm and I was drenched. And I had something like this, shoes, but I don't know what they were made with, with, with lace around my ankle. And I don't know what they were, they were made with, but they melted. My shoes melted. The only thing that was left was the laces around my ankle. And I couldn't pedal, you know, with without shoes. So I thought, well, I'm going to go to Limoges, which was one of the big cities down there, to see Blondine, my friend, her, her father was working in a shoe factory. Maybe he can find me a pair of shoes. So I was with a bunch of youngsters who, it was on Sunday, it was a beautiful day, and they were on a Sunday outing, and, and they, so I said, well, I better go back to Limoges. So I took this little road, and they kept going. And then I crossed this little village about a few miles down the road and you could hear shooting and, and smoke and said, what in the hell is going on over there? You know, there's nothing there. There's no rail, rail station, there's nothing. And then they found out that the German had been in this little town. And the youngsters that were on the road with me that day, they were, found them all shot on the road. If I had stayed with them, if I had the middle of this storm, 
you know, and my shoes melted, I would have been shot with them, you know. Uh, this is the kind of luck that I got with the horse. That's how I survived, just sheer luck, just sheer luck. And, those, and they never apologized for it, they never said, uh, you know, I think somebody said it was a mistake, that it was another orador that they were looking for, that we had resistance uh, fighters there, but they never found out, you know, what. Um, nobody was ever punished for it. Um, those Germans, when eventually went to the war, you know, to Normandy and so forth, and disappeared, you know, there was, no, so there was never money punished, anybody punished for it. Is the uh, war starts to end, what are, what are you doing at that point? Well, I worked with them. They got a job delivering wood to people in Toulouse. Um, people were too poor to buy it. The government would deliver wood to them for heating and, and cooking. And so I went with them and I would take care of the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with, with them until October 45. And then the, the job ended somehow, whether I forget how. So, um, so I went back to Paris. It was the end of the war for me. But that time the war was over. Mm -hmm. I went to Italy with my mother. Mother was happy to see you, I'm sure. Oh boy, was she ever happy. She saw me once when I was in Spain. She, f she found that, well, I wrote to her before, the day before I left for Spain, telling her where I was going. Well, when my mother got the letter, she was, you know, oh my God, what is this girl going to do with all those communists? And <laughs> she didn't like communists at all. It's so, okay to be an anarchist. Anarchist was fine, but the communists, oh no, no. They betrayed the revolution, you know, and so blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she was a very idealistic person. She was very um, a purist. She mm -hmm. was really... She was an anarchist to the day she died when she was 85. She, she uh, never changed her mind, never compromised. Always straight, you know. I have to admire my mother. She had guts, really. So she got my letter telling me I was going to Spain the next day. Well, she took the first train, came to Toulouse, managed somehow to find out some Spanish people, as she knew, and to get a message to me. So. They got me a 24-hour pass, and uh, so I could go and say hello to my mother. So I came to Toulouse, and um, so I, I told them, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for us, my brother and I, my mother would have gone to Spain in 1936, yeah. you know, when the war started. She yeah. was dying to go there, you know. She's always been a revolutionary. She loved the fight. <laughs> <laughs> so no one of the days she's going to die on a barricade, you know, even if she has to build one in the backyard. <laughs> in 68, she was in the barricades in Paris, you know, with the students, throwing stones at the cops. She had a wonderful time. She, she was 70 years old by then. She, she had a wonderful time. Uh, so I told her I'm going to Spain. Well, one of these days I'll maybe I'll come back. You never know, you know. But if it hasn't been for us, you would have done that. You know, she understood that. Mm -hmm. You know, so she let me go. By that time I was 20 years old. I was old enough to know what I was doing. Oh, I thought supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> she trusted me, mm -hmm. but she would have never said you can't do that. You know, she knew that. Morning. If I wanted to do something, I would have done it. That she mm -hmm. liked it or not. You know, mm -hmm. I was very independent very early. Um, I left my mother when I was just 17. Mm -hmm. She was still in Toulouse, you know, when we all left Paris. We were in the south and uh, I knew she wasn't going to get along very well with her boyfriend and that's going to be a disaster. So I said, oh, no, I can't, I can't take this. I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm getting out of this. So I went back to Paris on my own. And I had a boyfriend, so we, I lived with his parents for a while. And, but it was a miserable life. My God, Paris and during the war was the black years, we call them. You know. mm -hmm. Les années noires. The hunger, the cold. God, it was cold. 42, 43 was one of the coldest 
winter Paris I'd ever seen in a century. There was, I wake up in the morning, there was frost inside the apartment on the walls, you know. There was frost on my bed, you know. Uh, we had cold for two months, December and January. That year, the real cold started in February. Mm. At that time, there was no cold. There was no heat anywhere. Mm. So between the hunger and the cold, believe me, it was enough to make a rebel out of anybody, especially kids my age. Mm -hmm. And there was lots on them. And when I was working in that, in that uh, office, every day I would take the, the metro and stop near the opera and, and uh, go to the office, and I passed in front of a big cafe that was reserved for the German officers. And they were having breakfast. And they had coffee, and they had eggs, and they had bread, and they had, you know, uh, jam and butter, and things that I hadn't seen in two years, mm. you know. And I was munching on a piece of celery. And by the time I got to the office, believe me, I was not in the mood for collaboration. <laughs> I can tell you that. Do you still eat celery? Never. I haven't eaten a piece of celery ever since. You can tell my children, they can tell you. <laughs> Just the smell of it makes me sick. I just had to ask. No. <laughs> no, I can't. I just can't. <laughs> uh, what did you do when the war ended? Well, I was very depressed. I was exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally, every way. Uh, I was just... I went into a depression mm -hmm. for several months. And then my mother, bless her, she said, you know, you've moped around the house long enough. Uh, I got you a job. You're starting on Monday. <laughs> I said, what job? So you're going to be proofreader. Proofreader? She said, yeah, your French has always been very good. I'm on my best subject in school. You're working as a proofreader. I said, Mother, I don't know anything about proofreading. She said, well, I brought some galleys. She was working as a proofreader at the mm -hmm. time. So I brought some galleys. I'm going to show you exactly what to do. It's going to take you just a few hours. You say, this won't be very hard. Besides, you're not going to work in a daily paper. You're going to start in the print shop. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's it. Huh. And there was no arguing with Mother, you know. <laughs> I never said no to my mother, now that I think of it, mm -hmm. even as an adult. Um, so I started working as a, as a proofreader. Mm -hmm. And um, after a year, in '46, I met my husband, who was working also as a proofreader in my mother's office. And uh, so that was the end of that, that was the end of the war. My husband had been in, a, in the French resistance in Paris, yeah. and he had been arrested. He had been tortured, and he was sent into camp, and he was sentenced to death, and he got tuberculosis in prison, and he was a mess. When I met him, he was very weak and, and very uh, feeble, you know, very difficult for him to walk. And, but a fascinating person. Uh, he was 25 years older than me. And he knew so much, you know, about literature and music and, and the travel and uh, poetry. It was fascinating. So we got together and we had a couple of children. And then we were walking down the street in Paris one day. We met a friend of his who uh, said, hey, George, what are you doing here? Why don't you come to America? We have been living there since 1939. We're working. Why don't you come and you can work with us and blah, blah, blah. And George didn't really want to go to America. Uh, he was a Parisian, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but I wanted to go. I, had, I was so sick of, of the scene, you know, the, the same old politician who started the whole thing started all over again. You know, it was so depressing. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, please, let's get out of here. Let's go to America. What did I know about America, you know? <laughs> I knew there were gangsters in Chicago. There were cowboys in Texas. And that's about it. <laughs> all you have to know. <laughs> and so we came to America. Well, 
<laughs> I mean, like, that was a big surprise. <laughs> of course, it didn't work out with the friends, you know. And uh, after a few months, we found ourselves without, without friends, without money, without a job, without an apartment. <laughs> Uh, but there was a, a society for um, to help uh, immigrate immigrants mm -hmm. right after the war, you know, help people. So they took us over and they took put us in a hotel, um, 103rd Street and Broadway somewhere up mm -hmm. there. The Hotel Marseille. I haven't forgot. That was in 1949. And uh, we were there for I don't know. Ten weeks, and they finally found an apartment for us in Brooklyn. So we moved to Brooklyn. Then, after a while, they found my husband a job. Now George was a wonderful artist. You give him this guy a pencil, he could draw you anything, mm -hmm. just anything, cartoons, illustrations, portraits. He's just one of those, you know genius with a pencil and with paint, you know. So he, he, they found him this job making designs for a uh, linen company, embroidery design. And he made the most beautiful embroidery design you've ever seen. You know. So that we stayed to him in America. We had two more children after that. And then uh, we came to Woodstock. I'm still here. Where are you good? You still have friends that uh, from uh, the resistance? At well, most of them are gone by now. Um, my Jewish friend Kara, mm. um, I still see her and her husband. They have been married 60 years. Wow. They live in the States? No, they're in Paris. Okay. They live in Paris. They live in France. They're French. They travel a lot, but they, they live in France. And I just lost uh, one of my oldest friends uh, last week, Simone. She was 96. Oof. She used to go to galleries and openings and, and um, real Parisian woman, you know, curious about everything, fashion and, you know. But at 96, she finally went. That's a pretty good life. Yeah, she had a good she had a good life. But oh. my Spanish friend, I haven't. Oh yeah, I have to tell you some how I found them again. That was very interesting. I started uh, I started singing in '58. I mm. started I became a folk singer, singing French and uh, and English. And I sang for a French uh, organization called the Alliance Francaise. I don't know if you ever heard of it. They, they usually do a lot of uh, culture, French culture stuff mm -hmm. all over the world. There's about 150 in America. So I sang a lot for them. And one day around Christmas, I was in Hartford, Connecticut. Very small group, there may be 25 people. And after the concert, uh, I was talking with this woman and she came me and she spoke French quite fluently. I said, where did you uh, learn your French? And she said, well, I lived for uh, three years in a small town in, um, in Dordogne. I said, ah, where in Dordogne? She said, in Belvest, and I couldn't believe it because that's where I lived. Mm -hmm. And I said, my God, I know everybody there. Do you know Claude? She said, of course I know Claude. And Claude was the, uh, the top French officer of the resistance group there. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you have any news from them? Because I hadn't seen them in 40 years. Oh, yeah. you know. And she said, oh yes, we write to each other once in a while. I said, well, next time you write to Claude, ask him if he has any news from Soleil, you know, the French guy, and Tovar, the, the Spanish guy. She said, okay. A year later, I got a letter. And she said, I heard from Claude. And Soleil and Tova are going to be in Belvez uh, in July, where they're going to be of the old resistance group. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God. And, you know, by that time, I just can't believe it. In 45 years, you know. And, uh, and my daughter said, call Soleil. Call him. I know the town where I live, but I don't know his phone number. 
I called call the operator, you know. So I called the operator and uh, I said, Honey, yeah, this is Sonia. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> After 45. After 45, yeah. I was the one I was surprised. I thought I was going to give him a fuck. I was the one I was shocked. I said, I'm too surprised to hear that we talk about all the time. Oh, you know, when we get, we talk about the old about you. I said, how are you guys? How are we going to get it together? You know, why don't you come over? So that year I went back and I went and I found my old friends again because I went to sing in a little town in, you know, with 25 people in Hartford, Connecticut. That's wonderful. I found this my old friends again. You know. mm. Must have been quite a reunion. So it was quite a reunion. It was quite a, a sherry, reunion. Uh, the old Spanish guys were there. Oh, Not great. all of them, but some of them were still there. Uh, it was. Uh... <coughs> One more tape. Okay. <coughs> Holding on. All right. Let's see how we can do this. <coughs> I can take the, uh, the camera off the tripod. All right. Why don't we bring the camera over here? This was Belves. This is a little town. I had a room there, and um, sometime I didn't have time to go to the camp, so I would stay overnight in mm -hmm. that room. Until one day the uh, the SS came over, and I had to no. get yeah, out. Let's see. Wayne, um, if you can spin maybe the, the book around a little, maybe. There we go. That's bloody mic. The mm -hmm. mic is good. I'll get the mic. Okay. Let me get on this side again. I'll show you the yes. This is Belves. Well, let's go back. Okay. I, well, I'd like to see the uh, your, the picture of you with your long hair. Okay. And that was in Spain. This is a. Um, these are songs from a Spanish uh, uh, gypsy oh. who uh, who wanted to marry me, <laughs> and he was an old man of thirty-five. Oh. I was seventeen. He said, "Manolo, are you crazy? I'm too young for you." He wanted to take me to Spain. Oh, he played the guitar so beautifully. You know, I would have gone, but I wouldn't want to marry him. Good Lord! You really met some characters. Oh yeah, I have a poet to send me. Who wrote a poet about me? Oh. How cute I was, you know. But. And Here this is uh, this is the station of Belvis where I started. Mm -hmm. You were about how old in that photo? There, that was I was eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. This was the boss, Tova. And this one was a Citroen car. Ah. Oh, they were wonderful cars. They still are. They were the first. Uh, did you ever have a Duche Cheval? Oh yeah, I had one, but it was 1960. This one is that was the uh, the first uh, front wheel drive. So that a what, 19? Uh, oh, those were in the 30s. Okay. In the 30s. So that was Belves. Okay, and you had an apartment there? I had a, I had a room, just a little room. Mm -hmm. That was where we were, in the, in the hills, in the Maquis. This was some other girl, this is a Spanish girl. And this is Blondine, the girl from Lorraine, oh. who helped me. This one's Spanish, and she was Spanish too. And we were all doing the same kind of thing, but in mm -hmm. different places. And this was Soleil, René. And this was Tovar. And these were the uh, the group. Mm -hmm. They were in uniform then. That was in 40, 44, 45, because when we were in the woods, we didn't have any uniform. We didn't have anything. Hmm. This was the General Hernandez and Colonel Acevedo. They were uh, at the head of the, uh, the this army, mm -hmm. the guerrilla army. 
That was at the liberation of Toulouse, who paraded in the streets in Toulouse. What is this? Um, this was my... Uh, Armband? My armband, no, no. the time of the liberation. We had to know who was what, and, you know. Mm -hmm. I embroidered this thing, as a matter of fact. Mm. The guerrieros españoles. Very French. French fine on the interior. This is Carlos. He was arrested. He spent 20 years in, in Spain in oh. prison. And he came back to France, and he was blind. What they did to this man. This was the expedition in Spain. This guy was uh, from, uh, he was a miner from the Asturias. He was what they call a dinamiteros. He would take a, a stick of dynamite, light it and throw it at the tank. You know, I mean, the, those guys were tough. <laughs> they were tough. And they were so gentle and sweet, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but they were tough guys. And you used whatever uh, arms and equipment that you could That we could steal take from the Germans, from the Germans because the, the Allies never gave us anything, or very little. The British had sent us, finally sent us something, but that was at the beginning of '44. Yeah. We had been there for two years and nobody has helped us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing that really makes me mad, and when I see those movies or hear, read books, about the French resistance. There's always an agent who came from America or from England who came to parachute, you know, and into France and, uh, and told the French how to organize their resistance, you know. I mean, this is, that, that really makes me sick. Mm. Those are my mission orders. This, this I had a funny uh, authorization to carry a weapon. No, is that you, that, right here? Yep, that was me. <laughs> me. Funny hairdo. <laughs> that was in 44. I was in Spain. On the other side. Oh, it was cold. It was, he disappeared. You know, he came to Spain with us and we never knew what happened to him. Hmm. I don't know if he left or if he deserted or if he was caught or what. We never know what happened to him. Crespo. That was when I was interviewed in Spain by a newspaper man, oh. Paul Baudin. And from Combat. This is a newspaper that, uh, that he was writing for. And he, was, uh, he talked about the, uh, the expedition. Fernandez was the, was the general. Uh -huh. Spanish Republican exile had made him a uh, charbonnier, uh, you know, charcoal maker. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, the, the com combat made him a general. Hmm. So there was whole articles about him, about Spain, there were several of them. Hmm. I have a bunch of them. In fact, there's one of them that mentions me somewhere. A little Parisian typist <laughs> doing, you know, going to Spain with a guerrilla warfare. Warfare. A little Persian typist. Typist. I never tell in Persian typist, you know. <laughs> I think that's family. Hmm. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. That was in Spain. Yeah, the first day when we when we arrived in Spain. After walking all through this mountain at night, we arrived there the next morning, and I'm exhausted, right? And I'm sitting at the table in that little restaurant, and I'm almost falling asleep. And Tovar comes up, and he says, Hey, you have to go back. I say, What? <laughs> you must be kidding. He said, Well, you're not going to have to go back through the mountain. We have a car, but you have to go back to France. We need a lot of things here. We have to tell the general what, what mm -hmm. happened. Uh, we have to send him the report. And so I went back, and I arrived uh, uh, in that little town to find the general. Uh, I said, are you hungry? I said, yes, I'm hungry. Well, you eat, you sleep for an hour, and then you go back. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back again. But this time, I went back, and, and I see this column of trucks with men and, and weapons. And I said, what's all this? He said, you're taking all this to Spain. I said, I'm taking all this to Spain. How am I going to do that? So you're driving and you're riding in the first truck. 
And uh, here's a pass that you, that we got for you from the uh, for the border, mm -hmm. uh, the French um, military, and you can carry a weapon and you can take all those people to Spain. So I <laughs> I felt like John Wayne. Right. You know? <laughs> That's them to take to to Kansas, man. <laughs> <laughs> They so, all followed the typists from Paris. I thought they all take a 700 men with, with weapons and everything to into Spain. That's oh marvelous. God, what an adventure! That was fantastic. <laughs> and that was the winter when we came back. It started to snow, and that was cold and miserable. And now oh, I have a picture of Nava somewhere. Oh, it's Churi. That was Churi. Mm. He he was my bodyguard, and this was a little bunch of Churi. There was a, the chauffeur for the car, um, and he was the maintenance man. He was a mechanic, and uh, the other guy, I think he was Tovar, um, bodyguard. And uh, that was a very small little group there. Hmm. Very wonderful guys. Well, that was our cook, Antonio. And and this was Navas. He was garroted in Spain. And then here were Julio and Churi. And he was so, so proud of his car. It was always clean and shining. <laughs> but we were living in the woods under a parachute, but the car was in good shape, I'll tell you that. <laughs> He knew his priorities. <laughs> oh yes, and Antonio, when when we got some, finally got some stuff from the from the uh, from the British, they would send up the cylinders, and there would be you know uh, some uh, plastic and some stand guns and mm -hmm. some ammunition, and there was always some cigarettes and chocolate. So they kept the cigarettes, and I got the chocolate. Ah. Antonio would always get the chocolate from me. Now, is that you? Yeah. This is me. No, this is Esperanza. She was a Spanish girl. She was a nurse. Uh, this was the commemoration of a, a battle that we had there in, uh, in June 44. Mm -hmm when we lost a hundred people there mm -hmm. by the Germans. Oh, God, it was awful. God, it was awful. There was one man, I remember him, he, um, they were fighting and they were shooting. And he had a 17 years old boy and the boy got shot. And his father ran to him and took out his gun and started fighting in his place. You mm. know. God, those people were something else. Yeah, that was in Spain. That was in forty-seven. Well, they became very nice citizens. <laughs> See, all well dressed up with suit and ties. They cleaned up pretty well. Yeah, he became a photographer. I think he was a photographer before the war, mm -hmm. and he be became a photographer again. That was who? That was Tovar. Okay. That was the chief. And this was a uh, concentration camp in France that was started, uh, I think it was started in 39 or 40, for all the, uh, the people who didn't have any papers, mm -hmm. that were, uh, we didn't know who they were. Those are wonderful photos. Yeah, they were good. Well, oh, he was a handsome guy. He had green eyes. And this is... <laughs> Maybe this is when I green. saw them again. Yes. Mm. That was unbelievable. So then we meet again, you know, 45 years later. Oh, God. It, that was him again. Huh. You know, he was not the handsome young man that I knew. So that was the reunion after that. But in the, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was commemoration things. Uh, this was a thing that was given to my mother. Um, 
like a uh, commendation mm -hmm. or something, you know, for a soldier, soldier without uniforms of the French force. Hmm. Participate in occupied territory, the glorious combat for the liberation of the country. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> 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 And use Belvis again now. And they had uh, commemoration, you know, and all the old guys. This was the uh, thing where those two guys had been uh, right. run over by a tank. There's this, this monument for them on the road. There were several of those things all over the place. So many of our men were killed. There was one man who was hanged in his farm because he helped me. Mm. I had nightmares about that for years. In fact, I wrote a book. In fact, I, re I started writing this story and then I, I went on. And I wrote a whole book about this. Those five years. She's this little woman there. She's mm -hmm. about four feet. She's, she's not five feet. Mm. She just died a couple of years ago. She had ten children. Ooh. She had two sets of twins, I think. And for weeks she took care of, I think there were 19 men that she was hiding in the, in the, in the barn, that mm. she fed them, she took care of them, their laundry, everything, Amazing. on top of her, ten, on, of her 10 kids. You don't know what the French people did, you know. Amazing. Now we, we put the fire to this place. It was a nice little castle, but they started shooting at us. In fact, they wounded one of our men. So we burned the place down. I'll teach them. <laughs> Swine. <laughs> they were. They really were. They were collaborators. I mean, serious collaborators. He was. A, he would go to Germany and he would bring uh, officers, German officers, to his place. So we knew he was a real serious mm -hmm. collaborator. And that was uh, in one of those. I sang for them that day. That's playing the guitar, huh? Yeah. Believe me now, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lots of commemorations. Every year they go back. Oh, we lived in this beautiful little place. Little chateau. Mm. Chateau Conti. Oh, God, it was delightful. It was on top of a hill. And mm -hmm. we could see all the roads down below. We could see the Germans coming. In fact, we saw them burning some places down in their vest. They came there in June. And we thought they were fired from St. Saint, Saint John Day, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the South Sea. So some of people still do that in France, you know, and they make fire and mm -hmm. dance around it. And I thought, we can't do that. They, they, you know, the Germans forbid this a long time ago. It was not the French, it was the German. They mm -hmm. were burning our garage. Oh, it was a lovely place. Chateau Conti. I went back there. I had a lot of memories from that place. And Jacques and Lias died. And Jacques Rispard died. And Claude died. Yeah, Stova. My God. He was in his 80s by now. Well, that's a wonderful album. Yeah. Lots of memories of youth and adventure. And <laughs> I think that's probably why there's still wars, you know. They, it's an adventure. Yeah. And there's uh, youngster can't resist it, you know. I think I could have resisted that one, but. Um, I didn't really have any choice, you know, I right. just, uh, not only because of my upbringing, you know, with uh -huh. my, my mother, but because I really believed that the, that the German were really evil. What they were doing was, was, uh, was so bad, it was so bad. What they did to our country, the way we lived for four years. And you know, the, the resistance started in France in, in 1940. Uh, you know, I told you in, in uh, that museum, but then it started, little groups started 
here and there corporations of um, um, students, a bunch of students, mm-hmm. a bunch of doctors, uh, some newspaper people, some writers like Sartre, you know, mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, there was a, a club of blind people, mm-hmm. uh, women, uh, and of course there were the communists who, who had their own thing, and the socialists who mm-hmm. had their own thing, and uh, there were even royalists who were fascists in, in the fashion, mm-hmm. but they were patriot first. Right. So they were against the German, you know, because it has been the, the enemy for generations. Right. So they were, uh, not all of them, because some of them really went to the Germans. Um, so all those little groups, they were everywhere, mountain people, sea people, mm-hmm. fishermen, you know, who, who, who tried to get people out of the country. Um, there were thousands, there were thousands of those groups, and finally the goal, you know, when the goal, the goal was very surprised that there was a resistance in France, because that was not his idea. When he talked in June 1940 from London, he said, people resist, you know, come to me. He wanted the young men to come to him and start the army. Right. He had no idea that the people were going to resist in the country. Civilians? Women? <laughs> you know, the whole thing was absurd to him. It would have never occurred to him that people like that could, people could do things like mm-hmm. this. But he was very surprised at what we did. Very I true. tell you that. So, he never, he never thought about organizing the resistance mm-hmm. per se when he started. But then, when he realized there were so many, he sent a man named Jean Moulin, and Moulin was the organizer. He organized all those groups into a committee of the French resistance, Mm -hmm. a national committee of the French resistance. And um, eventually, and he he did a fantastic job putting all those people together. They didn't even know they existed, Mm -hmm. because the French are very individualistic, Mm -hmm. you know. And so he organized all these people and made them realize that it was one fight. And the better organized we were, the better, the more effective the fight would be. So, eventually he was arrested and tortured to death mm. by the famous Barbie. I don't mm-hmm. know if you heard about mm-hmm. Barbie. Uh, who, who killed him, you know, in prison in Lyon. But the, the, the work had kept going. And one, one group that was incredible was the people who worked on the railroad. We call them the cheminot. And what the cheminot did during the war, you have no idea the work that they did. In 1944, the day of the landing in France, in, in Normandy, mm-hmm. there was not a single train that ran in the whole country. They had stopped the whole shebang. Whole, not a single train in the country ran that day. Mm. Well, it take a heck of organization, I can tell you that. Sure. And I know firsthand because I was in one of those trains. <laughs> and at six o'clock in the morning, the train stopped in the middle of the countryside. Everybody go down. The train doesn't go any further. What do you mean? I have another 40 miles to go. Sorry, but we can't go any further. And that's why you walk the 40 miles. So that's miles. what I walk for 40 miles. And I did about half of it bare feet because I had shoes that were uh, slats of, of wood, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, soles that were made of wood, articulated, you know, mm-hmm. and all the pieces were coming, coming off one after the other, and the nails were hurting my feet, so finally I took off my shoes and I walked bare feet. Well, the last four miles were in the woods. Uh, have you ever been in a chestnut forest? Mm-hmm. Have you seen chestnuts mm-hmm. when they oh, are, yeah. with the quills? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, the forest is, is like a rug, uh, you know, of, of, of this thing. Ouch. At that time, it was in the middle of the night, and uh, I don't know how I got there. I had been in the train for three days. I hadn't eaten, I hadn't slept. How I got there, I don't even know how I got there. Uh, I arrived to the camp, and I kind of woke up. I heard a gun, you know, being cocked, and I, and somebody said, well, <laughs> Come back here. I, hey, hey, it's, 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 it's in one, it's in one. I said, what, what are you doing there? We were leaving this morning because we thought you were arrested. That was three days late. Mm-hmm. 
wish I was never, n never happened. So, I, I don't know, I think I fainted or something, or fell asleep anyway. I woke up 29 hours later. <laughs> they had bandaged my feet, were a mess. In fact, they were a mess for a long time after that. Um, and the smell of coffee woke me up. I don't know if you realize what that meant, you know. We hadn't seen coffee in years. And, uh, and Tovar was there with a cup of coffee in my tent. And I was asleep, and he was leaving. He said, where do you think you're going with my coffee? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he told me that I had been sleeping for 29 hours. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's like a blur. Uh, and, and there was nobody on the road. I thought I was going to hitchhike, find a car, a truck, yeah. or somebody. There was nobody on the road. And I thought, what's going on here? Yeah, because they didn't tell us why the train stopped. Mm -hmm. there were the bridges are blown up, the tracks are blown up. And we can't go any further. So I said, well, you know, that's what happened. They have been doing it for months. But then, um, this little old truck, he was working on, on, uh, on charcoal. You ever seen a truck working on charcoal? That was, that was very funny. They had uh, like a chimney mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the side. You know, and I've they work with charcoal. It didn't go very fast, you know, <laughs> very far. But it worked. So the guy stopped and uh, he said, well, I'm turning a couple of miles up, but I can tell the news. He said, what news? He said, well, the, the, the allies just landed in Normandy this morning. He said, oh, my God, now I really have to go to the camp. I just came back from Lyon, you know, with papers and messages and stuff. And... Um, so I said, oh boy, now I better, maybe I'll find another car. But I didn't find a single car. Another car, another truck on the road on that day. So I walked all the way to the, all the, way to the camp. Amazing. And I lost my shoes. And, uh, and he said to me, why did you take a shortcut in the woods? I said, what shortcut? I don't know any shortcut. I barely know the, the road by the, by the road, you know. I never take a shortcut. They say, well, you came right across from the road. You didn't come from, from the usual way. Hmm. And I was asleep. I swear to God, I was asleep. But you made it. And I made it. Amazing. Thank I, you very much. I don't know if I could do that again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate this very much. Oh, that was fun. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for um, coming.